Okay, I'm going to dive right into uh, this whole lean construction thing. Um, as background, uh, the Project Production Systems Laboratory here at Cal is all about how we design and make things in project settings. So if we think about uh, designing and making, uh, the, that's primarily come out of the problems and re reflection and practice in repetitive manufacturing. And there are good historical reasons for that. Right? But they don't have very much to say about projects. In fact, if you look in the production management textbooks, there is almost always a section that talks about different forms of production, different types of production system. And it gets down to projects. They recognize projects as a form of production system. But they say this is the most difficult and complex method of producing things and should be avoided if you possibly can. And you turn the page, and that's it. Okay? There's very little advice about how you would do that. Okay? And if you don't believe me, go look in production management textbooks. It's very quite interesting. On the other hand, let me uh, <clears throat> bring up, I'll take advantage of my slides. If you look at project management, uh, let's say, for example, many of you are probably familiar with the Project Management Institute. It has a project management body of knowledge. It publishes periodically with updates. And if you look at that body of knowledge, it has very little to do with how you design and make things. It has a lot to do with how you manage, you structure and manage projects contractually. Okay? Okay? But not how you actually design and make things. And in fact, I've had some people tell me, well, that's not the job of the project manager. That's somebody else's job. That's a job that we don't deal with directly, right? It's left to the crafts, to the builders, to the designers. Okay? <clears throat> so, if we're talking about a new way to design and make things, if we look at the available, the received wisdom, looking in the disciplines of production management and project management, we don't see them come together. Right? Okay? So we want to bring them together. That's our job. And we're not working in a vacuum. We're working in a worldwide community. Uh, there's an international group for lean construction, which is a, uh, a group of uh, academics and practitioners who have meet, been meeting since 1993. Our first meeting was in Helsinki right, uh, under the auspices of VTT. And that's, so there's some continuity in the connection in the room today. So that group uh, meets. They've just had their 14th annual conference in Santiago, Chile. We go around the, the globe. And I believe papers from 20 different countries were presented in that con con conference. Okay. So it's a growing movement, and uh, I'm currently doing a research project on implementation of lean in capital projects for the Construction Industry Institute here in the United States. And members of my uh, research team include Bechtel. That might be surprising to the Bechtel person here. Uh, uh, General Motors, DuPont, Petrobras, Dow Chemical, and a bunch of others. Okay, so it's a very it's a big thing going on. The Construction Users Roundtable just held last week in Phoenix a uh, workshop on lean construction. Okay, so so it's something that's uh, that's really coming up, and I I think it's the application to the infrastructure sector is uh, not unprecedented, but has been relatively underemphasized. And I will um, share in a minute a few key exceptions to that. So this is a, um, a popular representation of types of production system. If you um, we start down here at, with continuous flow, and continuous flow in this case means it refers to the physical properties of the material flowing. So continuous flow would be like food processing, oil refining, okay? 
those kinds of things where the product takes the form of a liquid or a gas as it moves through the processing stages. And it's continuous in its flow. On the other hand, line flow is for discrete products where we can uh, move them in small batches from one station, processing station, to the next. Batch flow, as its name suggests, we move them in more than single pieces, but in clumps or batches. Job shops are like a machine shop. It gets uh, orders from different kinds of customers for different types of products to be performed. So it's moving away from repetitive manufacturing. And when you get to the project, you can see that it says it's a very jumbled flow with one of a kind or a few products repeated. Right? And that's the area that we're working in. Okay? And we're, our native home is construction. But we think that project production systems are appropriate and seen in a number of different areas. For example, uh, air and sea shipbuilding, in product development, software engineering, uh, performing arts productions, healthcare delivery, uh, oil field development, where we've had some experience, by the way, very positive experience. And so we think we're, we're uh, the history, the focus in history has been on repetitive manufacturing, but even repetitive manufacturing is moving towards the notion of customized products. Right? So we think that, in fact, we're not following manufacturing, but in some cases, we, we think eventually we'll be leading it. Right? But in the meantime, we have lots to learn from the manufacturing world. <coughs> We put together, uh, I'm not going to try and uh, explain this in a brief time, but this is a, a schematic for a lean project delivery system. And I'll just point out a couple of things about it. One is that it moves from soup to nuts. That is, we naturally want to look at the entire life cycle of products all the way from birth to death. They're rooted in the purposes of the customers for whom the project is initiated, and we want to actively manage that value, value generation, definition, and delivery. And we want to actively learn through the project experience, so that not only within the project, but from project to project. Right? Uh, the lean ideal has been framed in this way to give customers products exactly fit for purpose instantly with no waste. Uh, what do you think about that? Can you do it? Well, but there are ideals and there are ideals. I've thought of, I've, I'm provoked to think about the man of La Mancha, right, and the impossible dream, right? Is this an achievable ideal? Yeah, there's a theorem in systems uh, uh, theory that says that if you optimize locally, you s minimize globally, right? Because you can't, it, we can't have a system that's structured to encourage everyone to protect their own interests, if those are different interests, right? And expect the system to perform as well as possible. Right? Just a fact. We just don't happen to think about it very often, right? But the implications of that fact are really enormous. But I would suggest that this is an ideal like the Man of La Mancha's that is never reachable but can be ever more closely approximated. Consequently, the notion of continuous improvement, right? that you can always do better. And you notice that these things tend to be in tension with one another. right? If we want to give a customer a product exactly fit for purpose, it's very difficult to do that instantly. 
right? If I want a coffee, I can go back there and I can get a cup of coffee, right? But if I want a double frappuccino or whatever, right, I probably have to wait. Huh? But we can always reduce that time and we can increase the value that we deliver to customers. And with no waste means doing that without anything unnecessary. Okay? And we, we can, uh, we'll see some instances of waste, I expect, before the day is over. So let me just give one simple example of a concept uh, and technique from the lean world. And most of you, I think, how many of you are uh, uh, aware of lean initiatives within your company or your industry? Okay, not that many. Okay. All right. So this is one of the basic ideas, and, and I want to connect it to the construction world. Uh, the way we kind of received wisdom about managing projects includes having a detailed schedule that's a primary means of coordination. Right? And what we want to do is we want to send a signal from some central point, the project management point, right, to each of these specialists. And I'm representing the system here in its simplest form as just a single line. Right? And <clears throat> the idea is that uh, we're coordinating through scheduling all those different activities. So if there's a step A, a step B, a C, D, E, we give A a certain amount of time to complete their work, B a certain amount of time, C, and so forth, right? And that works perfectly until it doesn't, right? So let, let me, this is a test question, and you're all good test takers, I know, because you wouldn't be in the room if you weren't. Uh, what's the only thing we know about a detailed schedule made at the beginning of a long, complex project? Yeah, that's not how it's going to happen, right? That's what we know, and yet we ignore that fact all the time, right? But there's an alternative. So, but, but first of all, why, do, why does that happen? Why doesn't it work out? Stuff happens, okay? There's variability, right? There's a, something breaks down, something takes a little longer than you expect, right? Something doesn't arrive in time to support the, the maybe this activity completes, but there's another one delivering something that's needed by this process, right, that doesn't arrive in time, right? And so the fact of variability uh, is in conflict with the attempt to centrally control, right? Now, we think we can reduce variability and that some of it in our business is a consequence of the way we manage, but we're not going to eliminate it, right? So we have to learn to both reduce it and to manage the remaining variability that we can't eliminate at any point in time. One of the consequences, as you can see represented here, of this approach, this push system at project management, is the buildup of inventories of work between specialists. And what does that do to a project? Increases your cost, increases your time, right? How long does it take to do a project? Right? If work's waiting on, we, we tend in our business to have focused historically on reducing the problem, workers waiting on work. Right? But there's another problem, and that's work waiting on workers. The red uh, triangles is, are work waiting on workers. We have both problems at the same time. As we have specialists who starve out because work is not released predictably according to schedule, and we have work that stalls waiting on the next station to be ready to process it. Right. So, so far it's working perfectly. Right. But what's the alternative? 
Well, there's this notion of pull as opposed to push. We, um, and this, again, there are many different possible configurations. This would be the happiest one in this uh, scenario, where we could send a signal that says, OK, today we want to, tomorrow we want to ship that these specific products to the customer. Right? We could send a signal up the line here that starts this process with only the lead time involved in the total sum of processing durations here. Right? As opposed to how trying to predict that, to forecast that well in advance. But let's, uh, let's review for a second. Some, there are some principles of forecasts that we would do well to uh, keep in mind. The first one is that forecasts are, by definition, wrong. Right? Nobody can actually look into the future, even though some people sell that service. Right? Forecasts are necessarily wrong. The further uh, you look into the future, or try to look into the future, the more wrong you are. And the more detailed your forecast, the more wrong you are. Okay, so I think we must learn how to pull. Now, let me give you a real example. This was from, and this is from the world of infrastructure. This is uh, from the Terminal 5 project at Heathrow Airport. And I worked on that project with a management consulting firm uh, working in the civil phase of the job. And we were able to, using 3D modeling and um, a web resident production management software, we were able to send pull signals to the team of people that were doing the detailing for reinforced concrete structures. And so we made detailed engineering the first act of construction rather than the last act of design. Okay. Then it moved from detailing to sending the model information to the factory where the rebar was cut and bent with numerically controlled machines, pre-assembled in the factory, <coughs> and then installed in modules in the field. And that total lead time, this shows a lead time of seven days. We actually got it down to five. So there's the pull signal. Some considerations. And um, the first is that uh, one of the peculiarities, one of the things we think about is what makes a construction project different from a product development project, from a performing arts project, and so forth. And, and one of the things we've come up with is that construction projects are rooted in the earth. And so they're necessarily a very local phenomenon. Right? So what are the consequences of, of lo location? Can you name some? Supply. Okay. Proximity of suppliers, availability of suppliers, of materials. Yep. Yep. Environmental. Yep. Environmental issues. Storing inventory. Storing inventory. Local rules, codes. Soil conditions. I'm sorry. Soil, soil conditions, soil wind conditions, right? Uh, kind of um, con uh, maybe social context. There's a set of stakeholders in this part of the world that aren't over in this part of the world, <laughs> right? Who may have their own interests and their own demands. Right? Culture. Culture, indeed. Right. So location really matters and. Unlike uh, air and sea shipbuilding, for example, which is also a project production system, those aren't rooted in the earth, right? They f float and fly, right? So that makes them quite different products. A second one is that we tend not to make repetitive products. We don't make millions of copies. Now, I'd like to make a caveat about that, though, that if you look at uh, what we build, the 
completed product is very seldom identical, uh, perhaps never, if you, if you take location into account, right? Never completely identical. But if you look at the parts and the processes, they're very much the same. So that gives us opportunity. Uh, when we get to final assembly, and this we do share with air and sea shipbuilding, the parts become so big that we can no longer move the parts past the specialists as we do in an assembly line. Right? But rather we have to move the workers, the specialists, through the parts. Right? And that's called fixed position manufacturing. So it's a form of manufacturing that we share with others. There's a high degree of engineer to order components. In other words, these are things that uh, cannot be produced beforehand. Right? Now we may be able through standardization to reduce this issue, but we can't, I don't think we're going to eliminate it. And there's a temporary project organization with a customer, we say here, who intervenes in the production process, which might have a negative connotation, but rather, to put it positively, the customer in construction is quite different than, say, the customer in product development. Right? The customer in a product development project may be involved by proxy in the form of focus groups or market surveys, but you're not making a car for that specific person. Right, or that specific organization. But you do make buildings uh, in exactly that way. So there's some things to take into account. The question is, can production management concepts and techniques like pull versus push be applied to construction so understood? And I would suggest that it can, but we do have to take these differences into account. Okay. Uh, some further key concepts. Construction's complex and dynamic, re resulting in lots of variation. Um, I might suggest to you that uh, we could understand projects to exist along a continuum. And perhaps on this side I could say we have projects that are simple, slow, and certain. Yeah. And on this side, we have projects that are complex, uncertain, and quick. Where are your projects right? If I put my finger in the middle of that continuum, where are your projects, to the left or to the right? My right or my left? This way? How far? Further? Further? <laughs> OK. All right. And over time, what's been the uh, change in the center of gravity? Where is it moving? moving to the left, OK? So projects are becoming more and more, we might say, dynamic. Right? In fact, I was just in a meeting yesterday with one of our production systems laboratory member companies. And we're working with them and other member companies to meet the challenge, how do we go faster without sacrificing safety, quality, or cost? Right? And the pressure for speed seems like it's not going to go away. It's just going to get greater and greater. Yeah. So we have to learn how to do it differently. And the argument has been made that as you move in that continuum from this end of the spectrum to the more dynamic end, the inadequacies of traditional project delivery become more and more apparent that we have to, we're meeting new challenges, and we have to have a different delivery process in order to meet them. Right. So. <clears throat> Variation can be in the product or in the process, or both, typically both. And there is, of course, good variation as well as bad, right? We tend to, in a kind of engineering mentality, we tend to focus on bad variation. But good, there is good. Can someone give me an example of good variation? Getting out of well, that would be good, huh? <laughs> if the if the clients if the clients ready to accept the facility. Uh, Sorry. 
Innovation, right, right. It's like product variety. I mean, the very notion of custom uh, built, right, is variation, right? There's difference from one product to the next, right? So variation on the side of value delivered is, can, tends to be very positive. Variation on the side of process tends to be very negative, right? Okay. So <clears throat> in, in manufacturing, from the uh, world of repetitive manufacturing, variation is considered the devil. Right? It's the absolute thing you want to minimize or eliminate if you can. We first try to eliminate variation and buffer any remaining variation. And that doesn't mean we're giving up on eliminating it or further reducing it, but at some point in time, you have to move forward. Right? The types of buffers that are available to us are typically capacity, capacity of resources, including cash, inventory, stuff, materials or information, and time. Right? Uh, if you, uh, some of you may be familiar with the text. If you're interested in manufacturing management, probably the premier text is called Factory Physics. And these guys are really quite clever at developing principles of manufacturing management, uh, really basically from, um, from a production perspective. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, our current strategy, and this is a broad brush, typical, I'm not saying everyone does it, but in our industry, the construction industry, we tend to sacrifice lead time and inventory in order to protect resource utilization. The consequence is that we tend to have high levels of inventory and uh, excessive working capital requirements would be a part of that and excessive lead times. I'm going to give you a, a real example here. This is from research that was done uh, by a colleague of mine and I for the Construction Industry Institute in the middle 90s. But I recently asked my research team, I mentioned before DuPont and Bechtel and those guys, right? I asked them, I, well, I didn't ask them, I said, well, it was a question, I guess. I said, well, uh, look at this. This is what it was like 12 years ago. I'm sure it's not this way anymore. And they said, why would you think that? So let me explain what we've got here. Each of these lines is a plan and actual production schedule for uh, fabricated piping. So this is from the industrial world. And in this case, we have, this is engineering. So they're producing the piping isometric drawings that are going to be fabricated and delivered and installed. This is fabrication and delivery. This is installation. So tell me what you, and this is weeks. And this is percent of total footage, piping footage installed at a certain, um, at some point in time. So what do you see? And this is real data and representative. Yep. Right. Yeah, fabric uh, installation actually was dead on schedule, right? What we don't see in this chart, of course, is the cost, right? what it costs to, to achieve that schedule performance, right? But engineering tended to drift. They were a little bit ahead, and then they fell off and then tailed off eventually, right? Okay. What else can we see? Yeah, and it looks more or less like they follow each other, right? That one's pushing the other. Right? In fact, if, you, if you're familiar with piping fabrication processes, piping fabrication is almost a dead lock. I mean, if you have the materials and the information the variation is very small, right? highly predictable. What else do we see? Yeah. I have a question. How can we be so close to on time over here if the fabrication takes a lot longer than what it shows? 
Yeah, it looks like to me, well, I, this is speculation a little bit, but I think, think it's reasonable, that what happened here was that they decided just to deliver, they started delivering just what they needed, right? Because they could at this point, because they were way, way, way well along. And so they just pretty much delivered at the last um, bundle of pipe at the, just before it was installed. But the reason, the way you could do this, because what you don't see here also is what's the availability. Um, for those of you familiar, you'll know, some of you will know this already, but uh, fabricated pipe comes in spools. And let's say there's three spools on a piping isometric drawing. And that represents the pipe going from, say, a header in the pipe rack, right, a big pipe, right, down to a piece of equipment. Right? that it's providing something to or taking something from, right? The problem here is that when they slip delivering something here, that may mean that you have spool pieces A and C, but not B, right? So the way you make up for that is by having people available to do work in case something comes through. So the productivity cost here is very high. But what about inventory? What can we tell about inventory from this graph? Mostly not a lot goes up Yeah, let's look, let's uh, just let's take twenty percent complete. Okay, we've got twenty percent of the piping installed, and I'm doing that to, to wash out or avoid any peculiarities in startup. Sometimes you load your pipe rack, then you stop until you get your equipment or vessels installed, and then you start again. All right, so let's just let's go up here to 20% complete. If we draw a line across here, we can see that it's going to meet about there, and that's going to be about week 17. Yes? Okay. If we continue that line across, we're here, and that's about week 35, right? So what's that tell us? Okay. So we have 18 weeks of pipe sunning in the laydown yard, right? Do we need that inventory? Is there a better way to do it? What I guessed about this, let me tell you, the, the real story is that my, my partner in crime, Greg Howell and myself, what we said was, look, <clears throat> what we think's going on here is that the installation guys have been burned in the past with late delivery of uh, spools. They didn't get B, right, but they got A and C, and so it was really not installable except with temporary hangers, which has a rework cost, right? And so they've asked for deliveries to be made earlier, right? They're still having occasional problems, and so they asked for deliveries to be made even earlier, right? At some point, that cuts into the time needed to actually complete engineering, right? And that causes the defect rate in engineering to rise which pushes out fabrication, making the delivery to the site even more erratic. So in systems dynamics terms, we have a positive feedback loop. In other words, a death spiral, right? But this is the way we manage it, right? Okay? What we asked them to do was to take half of this and put it in your pocket. Eight weeks. You could reduce your project schedule by eight weeks, right? And give half of that half to these guys, right? Just as an experiment. Let's just see how it works. We could not persuade them to do it, all right? That was 12 years ago. I think today it would be a different story, I hope, right? Today will tell. Any questions about that? It's a, I'm trying to illustrate from real life 
something that's going on. I don't have an infrastructure example. Perhaps some one of you will share one. It's huge. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the, to emphasize that cultural, the importance of culture, in most cases, in the projects that, that of which this is representative, we, we collected data from multiple projects. This uh, function, installation, and this function, engineering, were done by the same company. Okay? But you couldn't tell it by looking at the data. Right? Uh, reduction in cost. There's no incentive, though, for them to get the project done quicker. Well, there typically is incentive, but the first thing would be uh, to, to do it faster. But in this case, they're suffering a tremendous amount of cost. That is, the productivity of their piping installation labor is worse in consequence of uh, this erratic delivery. Right? So in other words, if they had had delivered to them just when they needed it the first set of isometric drawings and the piping uh, fabricated from those drawings and installed it, they could have achieved this or even earlier if they'd wanted to or deferred it depending upon which way was most valued to the project but at much less man hours. That's the first thing. But time is also a value very, very often. Andrew, are you guys going to talk about anything like this? Okay. Any other questions, observations about this? The culture issue is really enormous. Absolutely right. We've developed kind of habits of thought and action, and uh, those are well-rooted in our industry and in our individuals and in ourselves. Right? I came from this world. I mean, I'm not exempt. And... Uh, going to be difficult to change it, but it's beginning to be changed. So. Okay, here's just some uh, traditional versus lean characterizations. Again, this is a broad brush. I'm not saying there aren't exceptions out there, and there are increasingly more and more exceptions, but um, in the traditional way of delivering construction projects, decisions tend to be made sequentially by specialists and thrown over the wall. Whereas we want to involve downstream players in upstream decision making and vice versa. Right? And often the vice versa gets overlooked because we want the designers and the planners to have the experience of the consequences of their decisions. Right? Otherwise, they can't learn. Product design tends to be completed, then process design begins. Here's what you got to build. Now figure out how to build it. We want to integrate the design of product and process. We want to consider all product life cycle stages in design. We want to perform activities as at the last responsible moment. Now this might seem counterintuitive, does it? Why would you want to perform activities at the last? Remember, it says responsible moment. Right? What's the advantage of doing that? Yep. That's right. Yeah, one of the um, one of um, Taichi Ono was the uh, chief engineer for Toyota and one of the principal architects of the Toyota production system, which is kind of the exemplar for lean production. And he created a list of uh, forms of waste, and at the head of the list for Taichi was overproduction. And overproduction for him meant doing work before its time. Right. 
think about our little red triangles of work in process inventory. Right? That's work that's done before it's time. If we make decisions, at the, if we use all available time and resources within the constraints of the project and what makes the project value delivering for the client, then we tend to make better decisions. We have use it well to improve your design. Right? But what determines the last responsible moment? I'm sorry? Right. Okay. So if you've got option A, option B, right, A and B may have different lead times. So you may have to decide about B before you have to decide about A. But the last responsible moment is the point after which B is no longer an option. Right? So we have to understand lead times. And one of the things that we do in lean construction is to try and decrease the lead times for decision making by acting on uh, supply systems, suppliers and their value streams. Let's look at just a few more. Here's something around the if issue of supply chain management. As we, uh, there's a tendency in traditional practice to kind of take what the market gives you but we see enormous opportunity and companies are taking advantage of this opportunity to restructure and integrate their own supply chains, that is those systems of designing and making things that are populated by connected customers and suppliers. We've talked about the problem of large inventories one of the things we want, we're working on is how to size and locate buffers of all types to perform their function. And their function is to absorb variability so it does not disturb the system. We want to align all stakeholder interests. And we've, there's been developed some forms of relational contracts that are intended to do that. And I can give you more information about that if you're interested. And we want to incorporate learning at every level in the organization. So, just one last thing. This is a uh, rough timeline. Uh, you can see uh, this goes all the way back to Henry Ford and the introduction of uh, a lot of fundamental uh, concepts like flow and pull in their production system back in 1914, thereabouts. Uh, skip forward to Ono's challenge in 1948. In 1948, Toyota, along with uh, all of Japan, was pretty much decimated by World War II. They were um, operating in a small market, certainly limited to the national market. They had very little capital, and they had a tradition in their country of a high degree of product variety. So lots of different variations of models of cars and trucks. So their business challenge was how to produce efficiently a high variety of products in small numbers. Right? And when they went to the United States to look at how production was managed in the automobile industry, they found a system that was designed to produce large numbers of products, mass production, right? And so they weren't able to imitate that system, and they had to invent something different, right? Ono was challenged by the Toyota heading Toyota, Toyota heading Toyota at the time, to close the gap with U.S. productivity in three years. And that gap was nine to one and they did it, okay? Now, they did it primarily not through technology, although technology later came into play, but primarily through the way they structured and managed work, okay? The way they structured and managed work. Yes, sir? So it's a parody initially. Now it's better. It was better as of this. Uh, well, we know for sure because it was measured in the 80s 
in an international research project uh, done in which MIT was one of the principal uh, actors. And that uh, led to the book, The Machine That Changed the World, by Womack, Jones, and Roos. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that book. Um, but they did a comparative analysis of uh, the automobile industry looking at uh, Japan, Europe, and the US. And at that time, so the data would have been about from the mid 80s, um, um, the Japanese were on average in a new product development process producing a new design, new vehicle design in 48 months. And I was actually working as a consultant about that time for Ford Motor Company in Dearborn. And we were very proud of having produced the Taurus design in 70 months. Right? Toyota now is somewhere around 10 to 12. The next best that I know about is 19. Toyota is so fast that they can, they can, um, they're outrunning their own market. In other words, the market can't absorb the product, the old product, before they could produce a new one. Put that positively, they can wait longer than anyone else, design with better, more accurate information about what the customer is likely to buy and to value. Right? And so that gives them an enormous advantage. And they were superior, all the Japanese on the whole were found to be superior also in product quality, the extent of product variety, and the cost of production. Okay. So they're doing something right. And it looks like th that advantage, everyone's getting better, but they're getting better faster. And you've probably read the papers, right, about <laughs> it's coming. OK. <clears throat> in 1992, Lowry Koskala of the of VIT from Finland, VTT from Finland, sorry, uh, was a visiting scholar at Stanford University at their Center for Integrated Facilities Engineering. And he and I met at that time. And I had been doing some work on, a pr on production control on something called the last planner system. And we really got excited. He was, uh, he had been, um, he was looking at the revolution in manufacturing okay, that we later have learned to call lean, lean production, lean manufacturing. And wrote a report from his time at Stanford that challenged the construction industry to basically get our heads out of the sand. Right, and say, look, we have to stop. We, we, can, we need to take seriously the differences between manufacturing and construction, but those differences are not an excuse for failing to learn from manufacturing. We, they're doing something radically different in the way they design and make things, and we have a lot to learn. And so that challenge led to then the International Group for Lean Construction Formation. There have been a number of other major things uh, one of the big things locally was the declaration in 2005 by the largest healthcare provider in Northern California, Sutter Health, that they were committing their capital program to lean project delivery. And that has made a huge, had a huge impact both regionally and beyond the region. Okay. And that's the kind of thing that's beginning to happen. And as I said, we just held our 14th annual IGLC conference in Santiago. So I've talked long enough. Questions, comments, before I turn it over to our friends from Sunt. One question. Yes. The Japanese are so good in car manufacturing, applying lean uh, production and car manufacturing. How about Japanese companies? Um, I, I'm a little bit at peril here. I may be overstepping my knowledge, but my impression is that in the construction industry, there's lean has not penetrated very far. Right? Interesting. Interestingly, right? so. probably good news for us. I'm sorry. Yes. Right. Other 
comments? Questions or comments? Are we on the right track? How do we yeah. actually transfer Speak this? Speak into my chest. Oh, there's a All right. <laughs> <laughs> Should have a little. There you go. That's right. Hello, hello. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, wondering. I don't think it is I on. Think I have a lot of voice. So. <laughs> yeah, but he. Recording. It's recording though. Okay. The uh, how would you sort of? What kind of ideas would you have on on? transferring these ideas to your suppliers. Hmm. I mean, there's a lot of psychology involved, sort of team spirit which you develop. I guess, I don't know about Toyota, but there mm -hmm. must be a lot of team spirit in corporate culture. But how do you transfer these ideas to the through the chain from the suppliers and the designers, planners, and such? The whole, I mean, in construction you have a tremendous group of, of uh, large group of, of exactly yeah and, and how do you get that together um th that's probably a li and then they, they change all the time too uh, right different suppliers I mean. let me let me just continue on the Sutter Health story for just a little bit I think it's an appropriate response that uh, in 2005 Sutter declared to their whole vendor community vendor for them means suppliers of products and services that they were committing to lean project delivery. And they had, I think they'd made that declaration in a meeting of 150 people, okay? They had several other major mega meetings like that. And then they started doing more detailed and specific education and training. And they came to the Project Production Systems Laboratory and said, their community did, their vendors did, not Sutter, and said, we need, we've, we understand now that while Sutter is demanding that we go lean, they can't tell us how to do it. And probably no one can tell us how to do it. We've got to figure it out ourselves by trying things out, but we'd like to have some leadership and some guidance in that. We need a learning laboratory. And so P2SL has become that laboratory. But there are other, and we're working with uh, architects, engineers, contractors, subcontractors, suppliers, okay? And we're doing that through uh, experimentation on projects. So we have pilot projects going where we're testing different techniques and methods. Right? And another very interesting um, institution that has spun out of that initial declaration is what they call the Lean, Co the lean Coordinators uh, Meeting. And what Sutter did was they, they said, look, we would like for, we suggest that each of, of these companies, and that's the whole litany of, of providers, designate a champion for lean within their organization. At least one, could be more than one. And uh, let's meet once a month, have dinner together, and let's share what's going on. What we can learn from each other, what questions have been provoked, what new resources we've discovered, and it's really amazing now, when you go to those meetings, competitors are sharing information with one another. Because it's more than one mechanical engineer, more than one mechanical contractor, and so forth, right? So there's, it's, a, it's a different culture, it's a different uh, attitude. The idea is that if we can raise the bar, right, for everybody, then everyone's better off, especially because this way of doing work is more personally satisfying. We're delivering greater value with less stress, and it's fun because we're always learning something new. Right? So we'll hear from some of those people right, <laughs> in the next two days. So anything else? Did you need to? I just need to make sure. Okay. Go ahead.